Well, you remember we moved over from existential psychiatry to social psychiatry <coughs> as the parent organ of this, what I call interpersonal method. And um, I made a brief sortie into the history of the methods of social psychiatry. And um, as a way of introducing Sullivan's uh, intuitions. Uh, and I also emphasize, and I hope you all will agree with me or interest yourselves in some aspect of the connection between existential and social psychiatry and the way in which the methods can be understood in relationship to each other. And for example, uh, the effort to share another person's feeling and experience is not so far away, is it, from the social psychiatric interest in sharing the facts of a situation or the situation itself. <coughs> but we'll come back to all those issues, I hope, later on. In any case, so <coughs> proposing here to develop the methods of interpersonal psychiatry, at least as, as I've sort of taken the principles from Sullivan and then tried to add some inventions of my own. Um, you know, my starting point is essentially the reminder of what the familiar methods of social psychiatry are, that is the social service visit and the family interview. And uh, I wanted to, attempted to emphasize the ways in which uh, uh, those familiar tools, still used tools of social psychiatry, are grossly inadequate. And uh, I could have added that I, I don't think that the social service visit or, or family interview would be continued to this day if the purposes of social psychiatry hadn't become confused with the purposes of, 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 of analysis and existential psychiatry. That's the purpose of analysis is, of course, to, in large part to elicit the fantasies, just as the purposes of existential psychiatry can be crudely summarized as eliciting the feelings in contrast to the purposes of social psychiatry, which is to ascertain the facts. But so heavy has the infiltration of analysis into social service been uh, that indeed social work process uh, teaching, for example, is very heavily fantasy finding in its, in its nature. And that is, that's my favorite explanation for why the social service interview and visit have been to some extent continued even though they've been shown to be highly suspect as a source of reliable data. Now that, that statement might be challenged because I've only suggested, I've only presented one study, that the study of Adelaide Johnson, on the um, relationship between the social service interview and the actual facts about the family events. And, and indeed, that, those study, that study was only done with adolescent schizophrenic patients and families, and this is a relatively limited number of patients. But my contention is that so devastating is the results of that study that it throws the, the whole reliability of these familiar methods into question. Um, that's, that serves in part, however, as an introduction to Sullivan, because Sullivan himself would have predicted that finding. That is, Sullivan's theories indicated that that the social service interview, as, as usually done, and the social service could not elicit anything but fictions. That's, that's contained in Sullivan's ideas about the interview and about social processes. I.e., he believed that the average interaction between people was so anxiety-provoking, which in turn produced security operations, which in turn produced distorting fictions, in order to reduce the anxiety, it's so distorting, in other words, was the average interview, that its chances of producing anything but fictions were remote. So in that sense, although Sullivan's work preceded Adelaide Johnson, because Johnson, uh, Sullivan's work preceded Johnson's work by 30 years, and well, 20 years, we can say that it, it, it made a prediction which was carried out, if you like, by Johnson's findings. Now, <clears throat> Um, as you know, Sullivan didn't, however, explain how he thought he could offset this security operations distortion producing mechanism that was common in, in, in any interviews. Um, 
and as you've heard me say, or probably knew already anyway, uh, he was famous in his own time for his capacity to reduce such distortions in clinical situations, indeed to reduce even psychotic transfers. And, um, and as you know, it therefore occurred to me that perhaps if one studied his interventions, one might be able to draw out of those interventions principles which would, could be drawn up into a way of intervening clinically which would make possible interviews which were not so much matters of fiction. Note, however, that in order to do that, one has to graduate, so to speak, from the Institute. And by that I mean not in its literal sense, but one has to uh, get over the idea that the sole purpose of an interview is to discover fantasies, which is in keeping with the analytic quest. Right? Because if the purpose of the interview is to discover fantasies, then the interview is ideally constituted, according to Sullivan. Hmm? However, if one if one thinks that what one's getting are not fantasies but facts, then one, of course, is confused. Hmm? And I remember growing up, or thinking I was growing up, in, the, in this setting, being told, being having those two statements played off against each other. That is, when I said that I thought something was a fantasy and not a fact, I was told that, no, it was really a fact. And then then I was said, when I said it was a fact, not a fantasy, I was told it didn't matter. The important thing was the fantasy component. Hmm? Well, I, uh, I think we've studied, we've talked about that a little bit, the systematic error that's, in, that's implicit in that, that notion, although it's an interesting error. Um, and suffice it to say here, then, that, that as soon as one wants to know whether it's fantasy or fact, whether it's, it's the elaboration of the mind on experience, or what one would have seen if one had been there, you sell it in this then one, then one graduates from the Institute, so to speak. That is, one then adds to one's armamentarium an interest in discovering what the facts are. And the purpose of that is not to denigrate the importance of fantasy, which is immense and, and fascinating and clinically often crucial, but the point is to add a tool which would allow you to ascertain the facts when you wanted to have them. Well, the, um, <coughs> the, um, the basic... Uh, headings under which I have uh, arranged what I think the principles of these interventions are, are, are I put under two headings, that is projective statements and counterprojective statements. And I'm going to talk first about projective statements, which I also call my shorthand, that is making marks. And uh, I'm going to talk first about that. And then I'll go on to counterprojective statements, which I see as a subclass of projective statements. Um, now, how did we get the transition into this? Um, well, I'm uh, the I, I, the transition is poorly made, David. I'm sorry. The, I was saying that the that I tried to draw out of Sullivan's interventions the means by the principles of the means by which one could reduce the need for the security operations enough so that one had more confidence when was getting facts rather than fictions. Um, and that the, the principle, well, and I shouldn't say the principle so much as that the, the types of statements which it seems to me are crucial to this method are what I call project and counterprojective statements. Um, <clears throat> now I call these projective <coughs> statements because it seems to me that one of the neatest ways of describing what one is doing is to think of the of transferring the principle of a projective test into a, into a verbal clinical maneuver. In other words, to be able to use the principle of projective, te projective testing in a, in, a, uh, in a verbal exchange. That seems to me as a neat way of, of, of uh, describing the nature of this, of this intervention as I've been able to think of. One of your predecessors, um, a good many years ago, back, it must be about six years ago now, um, when I first presented some of these ideas, looked at me very disdainfully and said, uh, but everybody's always understood that. i had been struggling for about three or four years to try to understand this. And I was told, and uh, you, you might recognize who this was, if I were to carry out this description, but even a very uh, 
disdainful way, told me that I was, everybody had known exactly what I was saying already, and why was it necessary for me to take so long saying it, etc. I contained my feelings about that long enough to discover that he was right. And, um, and uh, what he said was that, of course, everybody knows this, these principles, because that's exactly what child analysts have always done. That is, they've carried the analysis out on the play objects of the miniature world. Instead of allowing the projections to collect on them, instead of offering themselves as the screen, they have essentially set up a miniature screen world in front of the child patient themselves, upon which the, both the fantasy and the reality, we want to come back to that, both the fantasy, the child's fantasy, and the reality of the child's experiences can be projected. And so I had to admit that that, uh, that that was exactly the case. Although, in fact, he afterwards confessed to me that he'd never thought of that before he heard me talk about that, this other thing. So he really was a full of fast. He, he had the decency to admit that he'd made that up afterwards. Anyway, uh, and, and later on, we'll, I think it's we'll try to demonstrate that there are many, that this essential principle has been come upon in many times before, and that uh, Fritz Perls made notable use of it, Winnicott Squiggle Game, I, I've assembled about 15 different uh, uh, different illustrations of this principle, including some aspects of what's called paradoxical intention, uh, can be shown to depend on uh, this principle. So I'm not, I, I don't think that, that it's original, although in this formulation is, is somewhat different than usual. Um, so that's the reason that I talk about uh, projective, uh, call it projective statements. The, um, as, as, as many of you know, I, I've always been very much impressed also by Tinbergen's Nobel address. Uh, he got his Nobel Prize for the, for the etho ethological work he'd done, and, and he used it as an occasion to proselytize a method of dealing with autistic children. Very interesting use of that occasion. I thought, no one you've ever seen his address, but uh, he uh, he developed a method of dealing with autistic children. He and his wife, I believe, which was essentially based on his observations of the way in which birds approach each other. And his point, that you will know probably, is that birds do not look at each other if they look at, to one side. And that he found, in, in essence, he found that in approaching autistic children, he could get much further and, and, and develop much better relationships if he never looked. Well, I, that, when I came upon that, of course, I thought to myself, well, now that's another independent confirmation of Sullivan's insistence that when you're dealing with disturbed people, you don't, you sit beside them on them. So there, there seemed to be a great many confluent things indicating that this, this observation had some, had some significance. Um, I, it also occurred to me that um, that perhaps it was no accident that, that, that human conversation very often begins with discussions of the weather. Uh, and that is indeed a kind of Rorschach device on which one makes neutral comments, one says things about that large ink block, the weather, which allow people to develop their attitudes toward one another. And, and it essentially goes forward not on the screen of each other, but on the screen of this large projected test weather. When I was a when I was a boy growing up, the, um, my father one of my father's heroes was Samuel Johnson. And this was a terrifying person to have as one of your father's heroes because because Johnson had, as you know, one of the most penetrating wits in the history of the English language. And I was always being asked to laugh at jokes which were really quite terrifying in there. Penetration. I'll never forget once going here when I was just a sick little resident. I went to the AP, one of the APA, the Americans like American Psychedelic Social Meetings, and um, Gregory Zilborg discussed three papers that some sadistic program committee chairman had signed Gregory Zilborg discussed three different papers in one afternoon. Well, Zilberg, as you know, was, the, it was a, a very brilliant man, unusual man. He, uh, He'd been in Kerensky's cabinet, for example. You know, Kerensky was Lenin's predecessor, was the ruler of Russia. It was the last sort of liberal democratic uh, ruler of Russia. And 
and uh, I think that the Zilberg had been the assistant minister of labor or something. And he was a very talented man. He came to this country and he uh, soon became a very prominent psychoanalyst. And he, he, he's the one who, who, uh, who uh, analyzed George Gershwin. That was there are lots of interesting stories. Here. Anyway, but but Zilberg, and Zilberg wrote the book called The History of Medical Psychology, which is the which is the best uh, history of psychiatry from the psychoanalytic point of view by far. That's ever been written. A very interesting book. But anyway, Zilberg discussed these three papers, and I was sitting there listening to this this discussion, and he he ended by telling a story which I had heard, and I had never remembered what its impact on me was until I saw what it did to those three papers. He said that he had been somewhat at a loss as to how to end his discussion of these three papers, because it was obvious that he had no great enthusiasm for any of them. And he said he thought the best way it was to end was to, was to tell the famous story of Dr. Johnson's rep response to the question of the poet who wanted him to write an introduction to the poor poet's volume of poetry. And the poet went to Johnson and said, then, Dr. Johnson, you must write a better introduction. I know you don't like my poetry. I know you think it's dreadful, but my, my children are starving. My wife is starving. My mother is starving. And so if you do not give, write this thing, I will probably starve too. Which Johnson replied, why not? Yeah. Well, that that kind of compassion, which, by the way, was only one side of Dr. Johnson, was also very compassionate. You've read uh, Walter Jackson, his wonderful biography of Johnson. No, the torn man you've ever been like that in Satan's in his really great humanity. So it's not fair to just tell that story. But that was the kind of story I grew up listening to. So, um, but I mention this as a long way around because when. Mm. Because when I realized why it was I understood that business about the weather, because Johnson also said that he thought that one of the one of the clearest signs of a third-rate mind was any interest in discussing the weather. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I thought to myself, I was always mentioned the weather at different times. I was probably looking for some way to get myself back on my feet after as a little boy heard that to, heard that story. So, so all these things. Um, uh, come together in, in this notion of projective statements. Now, <clears throat> well, there's still another source of it that, that retrospectively occurred to me. In fact, in some ways, the most interesting one of all. Um, without having any knowledge of painting, I had, as long as I had seen Cezanne's canvases, had a feeling that this man must be a great genius. I just said, I, know I can't paint, and I know very little about the history of art, but I knew he was a genius. I don't know how I knew, but he was, of course. Well, that I only found out everybody knew later. But if you look at if you look at Cezanne's canvases, you'll see something about them which is unusual. In fact, I've learned since that this is one of the things that that ex partly explains uh, an extraordinary impact on Western art. That is, they are not painted in the conventional way. They are not painted as as you know you would or I would paint, which is by making an outline. In other words, structure is not provided by edging. Instead, structure is built up by color. And according to historians of art methods, that is a, that is a big deal. Well, you can see criticism. Um, and you can, you can immediately get a sense of its relation to cubism, and analytical cubism, and a very bunch of other things. Maybe I should be more obvious. Anyway, Cezanne once said that he wanted to be able to paint the picture at once. And, and that interested me. And, and I didn't understand it. And then I, I read more about how he worked. And it turned out that that, that remark is, is, in a sense, self-evident. In the sense, you know, he worked by making marks. That is, he'd put a piece of color on the canvas. And then he would put another piece of color on the canvas. And the first one would affect the second one, and the second one would affect the first one. So in order to get the effect he wanted, he would have to erase the first one or change its hue. And the whole thing was built up by these, these dabs of color, out of which the structure of the painting emerged. Well, that, I thought that was fascinating. So you could see now why the hell he wanted to do it all at once, because every time he put something down, it changed something else. Well, that's the principle of making marks. I, I say to you, uh, 
It was raining in August. You say to me, no, it was clear. Mother said, no, no. I say, it was hot in August. You say, um, it was raining. Mother said it was clear. And I say, uh, well, your sister thought she was crazy. Uh, and you say, your sister was, um, my mother, my sister always said that about my mother. Now, the first and third are, are projective statements, i.e. they're marks put down out there to which the patient can or cannot respond. Now, I want to try to justify that procedure and indicate some of its very interesting characteristics. <clears throat> now, why don't I say, what was the weather in August? And I think a study of that problem will, will begin to interest you more in making marks. Because when I say to you, what was the weather in August? I notice, notice what I've done. I've asked you to reflect on your experience. I've invited your curiosity as to why I asked you about the weather. I have demanded that you, more or less demanded, that you insert that question into your mind, try to recollect what the weather was like, translate that memory back into language and decide you want to give it back to me. A formidable sequence of interdunctional processes, to say the least. On the other hand, if I say it was raining in August, mm -hmm. first of all, I've, I've avoided the high-level conception weather. Instead, I've given you a much more concrete uh, statement. Raining. You know that's the weather. And, um, and and my, my putting it down that way, rather than asking about the weather, involves a number of things. First of all, it's a, it's a concrete, it's a less abstract statement, so that the whole discussion is going forward at the level of an experience, rather than that very complex abstraction of experience, which is what we call the weather. Second of all, although my statement is wrong, it was not raining in August, and I didn't know what the hell it was doing in August. How could I know? I wasn't there. Uh, it was in part correct, because there's always weather. It's always got to be doing something, right? And so, in a sense, by saying it was raining in August, I'm saying to you it was raining, snowing, sleeting, sunning, clouding, or whatever it might have done, and I've, in a sense, invited you to fill in what it really was. So I've said, so I'm right about the class of events, i.e. weather. And I've given you an example, which I put forward hypothetically, and which you can then insert the correct answer into. So that's that's one thing about it. And, and I never, uh, I, I've always, I continue to be surprised at how that generally erroneous type of statement quickly produces a response which subsequently proves veridical sounding anyway. So, kind of sound? I'm sorry. veridical sounding. I can't say I proved that all these things are true. So, so here, let's take our first crack at defining a projective statement. It's a declarative sentence that evokes. <coughs> kind of declarative sentence that evokes. Now, why is it evocative? <coughs> I want to suggest to you that there are five reasons it's evocative. Five or six reasons. One is that it's concrete. The second reason is that it somehow depends upon a kind of reflexive process that is that, that I'd like to suggest, without knowing what it's true, I'd like to suggest involves less internuncial agitation than a question. It seems to me it, it, one can respond more reflexly to it. Thirdly, well, you know, isn't that the term that neurophysiologists use to describe all those processes between the effector and the, and the, uh, and the, the inner input and the output? Well, that's one of the steps. Yeah, interposed steps. Um, a, a, a second thing is it's concrete. It's also non-demanding. It's non-inquisitive. I'll come back to that. Fourthly, it's, it's democratic. Fifthly, it's leaderly. And sixthly, it can sometimes be what I call counter-projective some class, some groups within this large category of projective things can be counter-projective. And by that I mean that a projective statement, a statement that I project, can be used to take 
your projections on me and also move them out. That's what I mean by counterprojections. Yeah. It's a projective statement that goes outward and carries your projections on me outward, away from me. That's what a counterprojection is. But that's just relatively complicated matter. Now, I want to get to that, only not, perhaps not today. But some other time. I want to first interest you in the, na- in, the, in the values and qualities of projective statements. Well, can I say any more about the concreteness? You know, the purpose of these things is to is to place yourself in the patient's experience so you can see, not so you can share their experience necessarily, but so you can see what they saw. Um, you, you see how I'm already edging into something very similar to an empathic statement, the purpose of which is to place you inside the feeling state of the other person. Now I want you to, in a, in a sense, be inside the perceptual world of the other. So how can I, how can I share your perception? Well, I need the most vivid possible recreation of the scene. I don't want you talking about it. I want us to sort of share a kind of video of, uh, of your life. Hmm? Now, in order to do that. The worst thing in the world, I think, would be any abstractions, any talking about. It would be nice if I could press a button and show you rain in August, which someday may be possible. It probably probably isn't possible for any specific visual example to be close enough to be useful. And maybe that's why words are useful as communications. So so the the proposition advantage of my simply saying it was raining in August. Um, even though the sun was out. Because you then, of course, do what Cezanne did. You take my, I put my rain in August down. You go over here and you put sunlight, right? That means something has to be done about my, my, my thing has to be erased or corrected. But I've invited that erasure by my hypothesis. Um, so, the, David? Um, I can't resist. Remind me of something that falls under our first large topic, that is empathic statements. That, that those are theatrical statements. When you, you know, and, and to me, the wonderful link it was illustrated by your, your beautiful thing. You know that I read you today, the David, the little statement, or a little uh, Shakespeare's plea to God, you know, or, or Borges's account of Shakespeare, the man who was nothing and nobody, but understood everything and everybody. Um, that is, here Shakespeare was a man who worked, who used theatrical speech as a way of creating characters. In other words, he used empathic speech right, as a way of putting himself in the minds of others. But, that's, but this is a different matter. So, anyway, so, concreteness. That is, the creation of what you would have seen if you had been there, I'm arguing, is immeasurably helped by your making marks that are on a, on a, a concrete level, a relatively unabstract level. Uh, mother wore a green dress. Um, uh, these, that, these are put down. Uh, and you know what I ask myself, now why is it that, and then, and then so that the evocativeness springs probably out of the concreteness, but why is the concrete evocative? 
Well, I don't understand it altogether, except that it, you can show, you can gain evidence that it is from a lot of different sources. I mean, for example, poetic speech, which is supremely evocative at its best, right? I mean, it should give you the tingles if it's good. You remember, that's what Emily, Emily Dickinson said. You know, the only way you knew poetry was when you fly out of your chair. And, um, so it has to move you or stir you. And, of course, poetic speech is supremely concrete. Mm -hmm. Supremely concrete. And, you know, when, when Wordsworth goes to writing about Tintern Abbey and gets into poetic flights, you know, you, he's lost you for the most part. But not when the thing is concrete. And then I think from psychopathology, you can also see a nice evidence because in our psychopathological lexicon, um, intellectualization, generalization, are closely linked to isolation of affect. A loss of that so, so that perhaps one of the reasons for the evocativeness of the concrete is something to do with the way in which affect is organized around details. I am. Another one of my father's heroes was Napoleon Bonaparte. And, uh, um, and Napoleon has had a famous saying, God is in the details. And uh, what he meant by that, and he ought to know, as you know, one of the things about Napoleon's generalship that was so superb was not only his, his extraordinary patience and then his utter decisiveness. I mean, you know, he could wait till the end of a battle before he'd move anybody. Everybody else was jumping up and down in para, and he had these iron nerves, and then when he saw them making them, begin to make their mistake, he moved like lightning. You know. But the other, one well, of the other qualities he had that made him such a, such a effective general until he got fat and fell in love with Marie Louise and all that business, um, was that he was a master of details. He was an absolute master of details. Nothing, he, would, he could overlook nothing. And uh, so his saying was, God was in the details. Well, you know that, because in our country, uh, the saying is, the battle is lost for want of a nail, right? And how does the thing go? The, the, the rider was lost for one of a horse, the horse was lost for one of a shoe, the shoe was lost for one of a nail. The battle was lost for one of a That's it. God is in the details. So, the, so I, I, I'm not going to apologize for, uh, you know, in, trying to interest you in what are details, and details about details. Very real sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, that would be part of my case for the value of concreteness in evoking uh, uh, memory, reality, and we want to talk about uh, what determines whether it evokes reality or fantasy. An interesting problem that I can't get clear about in my head, maybe you can solve. Um, but, it, but isn't it as much in, in the concreteness, isn't it as much the way you present that concreteness uh as the concreteness itself? I mean, I think about saying the same thing, for example, if you were facing the patient, mm -hmm. wouldn't have it wouldn't have the same effect out of No, I don't imagine. think it would either. I think it has to be marked down, I mean, like out there, not mm -hmm. on the person. See, this, you can think about it in terms of the analytic screen, which is usually on the therapist. He's now being moved, so to speak, in another figure of speech, but it's to one side. So one one aspect is its, its concreteness. Uh, as I've mentioned already, a reflexive quality. Is that because sort of negation is built so deeply in a social interaction? So if I say it is raining in August, you immediately remember what it really was. <laughs> is there something? Is there some kind of system that we hook into? But I have found that I can sometimes get myself to remember things by making guesses about what they were, and then correcting them. Um, that's a aspect that's possibly associated to that also, both the sense. I can see where that kind of statement might be experienced as more intrusive than a question for, a presumption that you might know rather than yeah. an asking to share, but also because it elicits that reaction yeah. or sort of negation, I wonder if it doesn't also elicit some anger. Towards yeah, it could. It could. That's right. And that, that brings me to the third thing, that it can be made undemanding. Um, as I often will make these statements offhandedly, almost to myself, the purpose being not to put the patient on the spot. And, and I think it's true that, that a question tends to demand an answer by definition. And this thing can be left alone. It doesn't have to be answered. If, on the other hand, it evokes, it then, in a sense, makes you prisoner, right? But 
I think we underestimate the extent to which any question, no matter how tactfully phrased, evokes in its turn all the memory, not all the memory, the burden of memory for all the times we've been questioned. All the times in class we listened, waited in dread for somebody to ask us. All the times when we were ashamed of what the answer was, or didn't know the answer, or we damned if we'd confess it. You know, if you think of the sort of memorial burden of questioning that any human being, especially an educated human being, carries forward, you, you'd think you'd never ask another person a question. It's just, and, and you know, and the, and the district attorney phenomenon, which uh, is so much that question. As I said, I've mentioned it before, but it always comes back to me. The, my own memory is what it's like to have my medical history taken. And you go, you're too young, probably, to go annually or semi-annually, every other year to have a physical checkup the way I do. But even and then even though my physical checkup is, is, is done by someone who's interested, I'm fairly well convinced of the denial. I nevertheless, um, <laughs> I'm nevertheless I'm, I'm very uneasy as I see him moving into some of the question areas that he just quite sensibly decides he has to. And I can he feel my security operations preparing for what I'm deciding what, how much of the truth I'm planning to tell this particular time. Do you feel Eric started telling you what your heart was doing and sort of pink marks out there? Well, I, I've he done that, and I, he's never done it. That's and he never will. But I, I, um, uh, but I, I find it, and I'm kind of testing it. Like if you do that, you can often get a great deal more of my But I think I think it can be done in such a way as to free the interview up a little bit from this memorial burden of, of the historical experience of being questioned. I mean, you, know, you, you can count on the fingers of one hand, as a rule, the number of times people asked you questions that you were ready to answer. Um, it uh, it is true that, that there are times when we like to be questioned, and our personalities differ a lot in this. But on the whole, I think the questioning experience is questionable, as we say. You know, it's uh, it's, not, it's uh, not, been a, not been a happy one, uh, I think, for most of us, anyway. Well, uh, now there are two other features of this which uh, seem to me of particular interest and give it a significance, I believe, for, for psychotherapy, a very wide, a very wide significance. One of these I call democratic, and the other I call leaderly. Um, see, when I say it was raining in August, um, I have I have put down something that's wrong. I have said something wrong. Furthermore, I have done it with the utmost expectation of being corrected. I think that's democratic, and that frees up, I think, another burden psychotherapy carries heavily most of the time. And that is that it's an, it can be seen as an exercise in the patient's wrongness and the doctor's rightness. And that, that is, we, we can't avoid that if we work traditionally, because when you, for example, question, you say, give me the answer and I will see what I think about it. In, which, in other words, you're, I will decide whether you're telling me the right one or the wrong one, or a good one and a bad one, a sick one or a healthy one. So that the wrongness, rightness, I'm right and you might be sick or something. That that whole equilibrium is very heavily uh, disequilibrium, you might say. Furthermore, if I do the analytic thing and shut up, I am sitting there listening while you are making a fool out of yourself. And you may not be making a fool out of yourself, but there's no possible way to know. And furthermore, you may be making a fool out of yourself. And if indeed you are free associating, as everybody knows who does that, you must make a fool out of yourself. It's a kind of play. And one of the reasons that playful people can do it is they don't mind making a fool out of themselves. So that there's just no way, I don't think, that we can avoid the, 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 the disequilibrium of rightness and wrongness by any of the traditional two methods of interview. However, if I say, it was raining in August. And you look at me and say, it was raining in August. It was the driest August in history. You know? I have made a fool out of myself. And you, moreover, have been able, you know, to correct me. 
Now, I, I'm, I'm talking now not just about crazy, this being valuable, not just with crazy people. It's obviously a great help for a crazy person who thinks he's crazy to be able to straighten out the doctor who doesn't therefore mind but is grateful because he's got something new out of it. Right? So that may be a transaction quite unique to many of our uh, very, very shy characters. But I'm not sure, I don't want to just interest you for that reason. I really think it, it, it strikes a heavy blow against this this uh, disequilibrium. Um, There's not just a patient who can't stand always to be wrong with the person. I've had patients who can't stand for me always to be wrong and gone through entirely mismanaged interviews trying to find your technique, in which uh, every statement that I make the patient simply agrees with it. Mm-hmm. Who is raining in on this audience? However, you know, the patient will defend the patient's death your right to be wrong. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, this is very much the case with many people, because it produces something of great interest to you. And, and I sometimes, if I think that's happening, I'm in the hands of a subtle person who does it cleverly, so I don't know that I'm being, being uh, taken in, but I will make contradictory statements. I have a man now, I just came to make this uh, real first way we were doing. And, uh, and uh, he presented himself as as a clergyman, present himself as an honest man. And uh, and I noticed that he was agreeing with the great one thing, and furthermore he was flattering So I, I introduced gradually contradictory statements. At first I kept them far enough apart so he wouldn't notice what he'd done. And then I brought them closer and closer together. Now I didn't want to accuse him of being a phony. I wanted him to have it creep up on him that I knew, but was not the rude kind of person who would get it at him. But that I would give him a little bit of a bootlegger's wink, so to speak, thinking that I knew what he was up to. And I didn't mind it. I mean, how do you have to have something wrong? You pay these fees, right? <laughs> but I wanted, I wanted just to slip in without making it a big case. I didn't want an insight. Uh, and, and he did work. And he, he got a little uneasy. And so that I saw. And he backed off, and he didn't do it. And I tried a few more. And then he began to be honest with me. At the end, I said something about how, you know, when you've lost your old man when you're six, it's, you know, you like to please people. Maybe there's something to that. I said. So he knew I knew that I therefore could put some rationale behind it. The need to be so pleasing, which in turn made him enormously successful because he found all these people. And I think that he really agreed with them, liked them, which was very bad in his domestic life. So. Anyway, so that I think you can. You know, you're given a fair amount of freedom in what statements you make. Well, the other thing, and I won't uh, move along here, <clears throat> the, um, the other thing I wanted to, two other things I want to talk about was the leaderly quality of this. Remember, I've argued that it's evocative because it's concrete, reflexive, um, relatively non inquisitive. Um, democratic, and now I'm going to say leaderly. Um, that is, it is you who, you um, are essentially taking the first step. And if, if for example, you, you want to uh, uh, say something nasty, you don't, you don't put yourself in the position of saying to someone who's never said anything nasty or feels very bad at saying something nasty, inviting them to say something nasty. That seems to me unfair. How could they know how to do it? So I, and the phrase now comes from Sullivan, you want to set an example of desperation and rage in situations which call for desperation and rage. And so by my saying something, you know, that first I set an example of how we might look at it, so to speak, or how we might feel about it, I might say that. So, or how it might be looked at. The um, I, I I'm very impressed by the importance of that because if someone you know if our views of just showing them how or leading them into it seems to be mistaken and, uh, uh, and bad therapy too in the sense that, uh, that how can they possibly learn in a circumstance where the behavior isn't at all modeled for them in fact the opposite is modeled for them a kind of detachment and curiosity rather than more active involvement in life. 
Um, so I think the leaderly aspects of it, which might be conflicting with the democratic quality of those, but they both seem to me to be present in some measure in the nature of these um, of projective statements. Now, it's, obvi it's obvious that... I was just going to... But aren't those, those, those six qualities that you outlined, aren't those as much a part of how the statement is said as, as what the statement is? I mean, aren't, aren't, aren't the subtleties of the inflection and, and the way it's said as, as, in, as important in, in determining how, how democratic or how leaderly or yeah. how concrete or how non-demanding or all those things well, but, the as the actual but, but that's true. But it is true that there are implicit things in there too, aren't there? In fact, the, the statement is something like not, it's not a, it's not a statement or a question about something. It's a description. It is raining in August. That's, 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 um, however said, that's concrete. Um, furthermore, because it's said first, it's leader. You know? Okay. Well, I mean, I don't mean that the, the tone and attitude is, is, is not important. It's obviously tremendously important. And, uh, but I don't think it's exclusively, I don't think it's, I don't think it's exclusively uh, it's not there. And, and you know, and it's true, I know people can ask questions in such a way that, uh, that they seem to free us up, and uh, that's hard that people have. So, you know, I don't have it myself. That may be one of the reasons for my interest in it. Um, For people who could make a statement like, uh, it's, it's raining, it was raining in August, and the patient would just kind of look at them like, well, what does that have to do with anything, or, or what do you, what well, do, you I, do? You know, well, I, that's what comes into it. You know, how do you select what to say? I mean, it's obvious that you know some things are going to be more be more evocative than others, and it, and it all depends again when I come back to clinical imagination. But let's say one is trying to construct a theme, and and do try because you I think you really become enamored of it. You know, I'd like to know what Sunday afternoon is like in his family. Well, you can't say the person tell me what Sunday afternoon is like. Try that. You see, all the Sunday afternoons merge together. <laughs> you know, there's no habit. And a very, a very capable patient who's, who's imaginative, can handle that. But most of us, particularly we're defensive, haven't got a chance. On the other hand, if I say uh, it was raining in August, or it was raining on Sunday, you know, and, uh, or I, maybe I try to be a little more specific. Maybe we've been talking about something. Maybe we've been talking about the family. And then I say, of course, Sunday afternoon is always a bore. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a little detail, a little mark somewhere. Yeah, a lot of but then we hear about one. Maybe it was interesting. Right? And then I say, but your sister was absent. Oh, you know, it doesn't matter. She's, oh, no, my sister was right there. I mean, uh, got my, I got sister there. And if I'd asked him where the sister was, when the hell it would, see, because he's picked out of that projective field a particular day he's thinking of. And he's gradually going to build up what that day is if I give him a little bit of help. And it's only much later I'll discover it, the day on which his father told his mother that he was leaving. And I don't want to know what it's about yet. That would be to paint the picture all at once, <laughs> and you can't do it. Um, so then I say something about, uh, you know, it goes along, and he'll, he'll give you ideas, well, and, and mother came down, and I suppose your father wasn't there either, or something. And then we find out, and then he remembers what it was about this day that, that made him bring it up at all, which was that this was the day father told mother that he was leaving. So it's quite exciting. It's unexpected. I don't want to make it sound easy, but it, I, 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 it, it, it surprised me that it worked. That's why I call it evocative. That it came after I discovered it worked. Because it, something must be happening that these things occur out of it. And, and I, I may be making the argument backwards. How do you pick what you say? I, I am less discriminating about that than I used to be. I, I now call on my own sort of free association. You see what I mean? Sometimes it's a wonderful way to change the subject too, if you don't think everything's happening. And again, you've got to get over the habit of, of, of feeling that you would make reasonable statements, or probably true statements. It hobbles all of us awfully in terms of the, the kind of playfulness which this partly involves. 
kind of creativeness. I don't know it's creative, it's been building a lily, but the kind of um, chance taking. And one of the and one of my efforts may be defensively to justify it is to remind to remind one that you know that this is the way medical history taking works to some extent. You know, think think about how it how, how it works. And you come in and you say, uh, I have right up a quadrant pain, huh? I look at you and I say, um, maybe it's worse after uh, no complaint. That's a, that's a projected statement. Uh, and you say, no, it isn't. It's very important to me. That moves it, you know, from the gallbladder maybe to the, to the small intestine. And, uh, and I go forward that way. I can, I can do that in questions, but if you find yourself working very rapidly in emergency, then you don't do a lot of questions. You mention things to people. See how reflexively they, they, they can respond. And why is that true? Because in medicine we have a vast system of hypotheses, what are called differential diagnoses, which we slip into the clinical situation to see if there's a fit. And if there isn't, we throw it out and put another one in. And that's sort of like this. Well, I slip in, it was a great day in August. I mean, that fits or doesn't fit, doesn't matter. I got lots of other days in August I can throw right in there. And we're working in a more wide open field, maybe, in the human experience, than the highly codified frequency of the body. But not so many things happen. It isn't, it isn't impossible to wonder what might have gone on. When you think about the complexness of the process of using the projector and how it's been understood, that occurred to me is that um, if we're talking about conflicts with people are having and we're somehow facilitating the resolution of those conflicts, and if the transference is a kind of projection, and if we need the definition of transference, it's an active re experience of early unresolved. Then the kind of if you speak and ask the patient to reflect on the transference, then you're really not being there. You're not really uh, you're, you're not living where the patient is. Where the patient is actively the experiencing, and so uh, that calls for um, a interaction that uh, speaks to mm -hmm. an active to an active re experience, not to a uh, first state statements or a process mm -hmm. that would ask somebody to reflect on, mm -hmm. on um, what what they are doing. Mm -hmm. But in effect it, the understanding comes from well, I think of it here, but comes from not the reflection on the transference or on the projection, but through the uh, the action is happening with the re-experiencing, and you deprive the patient of the experience. The object is not to deprive the patient of the experience. No. The object is to, the goal is to... Maybe deepen it. Yeah. Right. Deepen the experience of the you know the experience you have a better grasp of it. Well, when you're when somebody comes in with right upper quadrant pain, you know one way is to ask them to reflect on it. But they're sitting there with right upper quadrant pain, and the goal is to find out what the right upper quadrant what is to is, is the cure of the right upper quadrant pain. And to but you're saying reflexive, right? Reflexive. You were saying reflective or reflexive. I'm saying that I think uh, the reflexive or the mm -hmm. being there without the interventional mm -hmm. processes uh, that the. the the, the transference that projects that there is a connection that the psychoanalytic is my understanding is is that, that the transfer is an active re experiencing. And the question is how are you how are you going to approach an active re experience? How do you approach but so then was active you weren't trying to do that like No, but he was he was carrying it over to that situation. Right? I think making a case against it talking about again as opposed to the language it's more. Perhaps I misunderstood you, but then you may talk. Mm -hmm. the, um, 
Maybe so. I wouldn't care. Why not trust some of your own intuition? If, yeah. you're, if you're looking for a particular piece of the puzzle, then haven't you already lost it? I don't know. Lost it all together to begin with. I mean, okay, well, that's, that's a, if Cezanne painted one stroke in anticipation of the next, he would have to take it down as far as he did. If there were laws. Well, right. along this line, and I would close by raising the question of how do you. How do you determine whether you get fantasy or fact? That's very relevant because a lot of the projective test, classic projective test like the Rorschach, is used to collect fantasies. And indeed, that's thought to be a great thing. And Herman Rorschach uh, was influenced by the secondary ideas. This is one of the few lively links between psychology and psychoanalysis. And American form, anyway. In fact, but, uh, the Rorschach could be used as a way into the unconscious. I don't know whether you've ever done Rorschachs. Once upon a time, I tried to do Rorschach tests. The worst thing that was like. And I also gave our own Boston contribution to it, this industry, the thematic apperception test. Henry Murray, part of the psychology clinic, developed the thematic apperception test. And uh, I'm just pre associated now, but this is close as I've got to an answer to my question, what do you get back to um, Because the thematic apperceptionist is not using plus, what it uses is real pictures. And, uh, this famous one, a boy with a violin, a youngster looking up at the older person. And they're all very, very carefully selected. For what? To get at fundamental complexes. Right? That's what, that's what uh, Henry Murray was after. He was, you know, one of the very few people after Freud who developed a new complex. You know what complex Henry Murray discovered? The urinary complex. The, Ic the Icarus complex, so called. You should read about it sometime. It's quite a tour de force. The, the Icarus complex, you know, flying, flying, burning, falling. Anyway, that's that kind of thing. Urinating fits in there, but. Yeah, the urinating fits in there. It's, why it's, a, it's a stage in the, in the, rest, in the development of the Oedipus complex, where somewhere between phallic narcissism and that one. Yeah, it's interesting. And, but and, and Henry Murray dealt with Mount Everson. And I noticed that giving TATs, 
that she often got fancy, but she also often ended up getting a reconstruction. So, one of my answers to the question is which you get depends upon what kind of stimulus materials you get. If you give something which is which is the stuff of fantasy, like, it, like an ink block, maybe you're more likely to get them. While the more concrete and realistic detail, maybe the more you're likely to get it. That's obviously not, a, not a, an exhaustive or even perhaps effective answer. It's an interesting problem. It's consistent with the mental analogy of birds and feathers together. Ask for fantasy, you get fantasy. Or well, give fancy examples and you get fancy That might be a better answer than mine. Very few of them. That's good. That's a good idea. Well, I thought next time, if you stand more of this, I will, I'm going to talk some about, or maybe you want to talk some about these things, but I'll also talk some about counterprojective statements. Counter-projective. Counter-projective statement. I mean, it's, a, it's a bad use of language because it, it isn't, doesn't counter the projective test projection of the therapist, which is what projective statements are. It counters the projections of the patient. So I'm pulling a double way in the language. And if I had to do it over again, I'd give up the language altogether. But I'm not going to try to switch that back. Well, a certain amount of confusion these things is sometimes It sounds fundamentally unanalytic. There's something about the fact that when you're talking about counterprojective statements, you're talking about Out there. We, we hope to keep them out there. Well, I don't know. It's just going out there. I mean, That's right. What, what's the experience of a patient who makes his projection, um, you hear that, um, and then make your projection? I think that it has something to do with his sense of you are taking his projection going into you, somehow doing something to you, and then your projection back to him is somehow um, a result and influenced by what he's done to you. Yeah. Um, so somehow in there, I think there must be some benign effect of the patient being able to make projections which are somehow um, perhaps put in some sort of frustration or depression, mm -hmm. um, paranoia or something, um, in the affect level, mm -hmm. and then your projections coming back in a way that are somewhat more benign. Um, that in this Mutual give and take, the, the feeling level is, is very um, important. I'm sure you're right about that. Whether the other thing is very interesting. You, you make me think of this discussion that we've given me when I presented some of this material in New York recently by a psychologist named Gilead Nachmani. And um, well, he gave me this most fantastic discussion of some of my stuff. Which I didn't even know that I didn't understand at all. But it seemed crystal clear every now and then. And uh, like those lucid moments during the psychosis. And, uh, <laughs> and one of the things he said was that, that projective statements serve to triangulate the relationship. I.e., they, they establish a fixed objective point outside, which stabilizes the relationship. He said that, just like that. With huh? Like the North Star. North Star. Right? No, that, uh, and that, get your bearings together. And then he said that turns, listen to this, and then he said that turns transference into a therapeutic alliance. Because when there's a fixed point, the relationship is stabilized. And what was people swimming in transference now is stabilized by this projective statement's objectivity outside. That's a pretty heady stuff. <laughs> you know, triangulation is a big deal. The triangulation reminds you of the Oedipus complex. 
And in Boston, when you go to a the Oedipus complex, then you remember Elizabeth Zetzel, and then you know that if you can get to a triangulation situation, you have a chance for authentic development. That's the teaching. But if it remains dyadic, you're lost. You never get it. It's only when it's triangulated that, that, that the uh, process of the resolution of this complex takes place. That's a very big thing. That's thing. That's why you can only analyze those people who are in or close to the Oedipal situation. And have had Oedipal life experiences early. It's very, very devastating. Well, that's what that's what Gilead Nukmani was suggesting for a moment there. <laughs> In the Big Apple, though, right? <laughs> no. I wonder if it might not be helpful to, to see some actual interviews. I mean, yes. Um, yes. Just because. Uh, I would imagine if people hadn't seen you do much interviewing, it would, a lot of this would seem very But I don't think it's, uh, if, well, maybe it's my limitation, but even in the, in the written account, it would be quite the same feel for it as it actually seems. 